Italy has been stuck in political gridlock since February, when general elections proved inconclusive. However, yesterday appeared to deliver a breakthrough when President Giorgio Napolitano appointed Enrico Letta to try to form a government. With me to discuss Letta's prospects, and indeed those of the Euro area's third largest economy, is Dr. David Hine of Christchurch, Oxford University. David, thank you so much for joining us today. Great pleasure. I think our first question has to be, who is Enrico Letta and why has he been appointed to try to form a government? Well, uh, Enrico Letta is a 46-year-old, um, I suppose he'd be best called a technocrat. He's got a lot of experience both in politics and public policy making. He's been around the edges of public life almost all his career. He uh, started out on the left of the Christian Democratic Party and then uh, moved into the so-called Democratic Party when that merged with the left of the Democratic Party, when that merged with the, uh, the former Democratic left to form the Democratic Party. Um, and he's been uh, Minister of Industry and he's been uh, a key, key post, uh, Under Secretary of State in the Prime Minister's Office during the period of Romano Prodi's Prime Minister ship in 2006-2008. So that's who he is. Um, he's generally thought of as extraordinarily capable, um, uh, a, good, a good man with a policy brief. Uh, I wouldn't say he's a great communicator, but he does have the great virtue of being relatively young. He's not the youngest Prime Minister Italy's had in the post-war period, but, but practically so. And given that there's a great debate about generational mm. change and the old guard uh, not giving up and so on, um, it's a wise move. Why has he been chosen? Well, he's been chosen because um, this probable grand coalition uh, that's got to emerge from the mess of February's election uh, really needs to be led uh, for two distinct reasons by the centre-left, by the Democrats. Um, and in their debacle last week, uh, trying to elect a president of the Republic, uh, pretty much the entire high command of the party was repudiated uh, in succession um, in various proposals, and uh, they all resigned. Um, so it was actually quite difficult to select the leader, Pierluigi Bersani, because he was nominally responsible for this debacle. Um, Letter, however, being a technocrat as well as one of the leaders, he was deputy to uh, Bersani, is probably the best thing they can, they can do. Um, and uh, the other reason is that, of course, Mr Berlusconi wants a grand coalition, but he does not want to take charge himself. And in any case, it's appropriate. The Democrats have a majority in the chamber, uh, or near majority in the chamber, if not in the Senate. So uh, they, have to, they have to do it. Now, I've been reading as well that Letta also has a very unusual and interesting connection with Berlusconi. <laughs> and this is something that we've discussed as keeping it in the family. Can you explain what that relationship is and what factor that might have to getting oh. Berlusconi and his party, the People of Liberty, into a grand coalition government? Yeah. Well, uh, the, the, the factor is simply that Enrico Letta is Gianni Letta's nephew. Um, and uh, in that sense, there is a, a family connection. I don't think we should make too much of it. Um, Italian politicians have been round round long enough uh, for them to have close connections, even without being uh, linked by ties of blood or, 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 or family. Um, so I don't think that's the key thing. The key thing that's tying the two sides together is, of course, that neither has a majority. And the parliament is split into three. One side, um, one, one of those three, uh, the Grillini, the five-star movement, won't play at all. So the other two effectively have to work together. President Napolitano knew that right at the beginning. Mm. Uh, the other two have been dancing around it. Berlusconi wants to look responsible, wants to look like the man who, even though he lost, didn't, didn't win the election, um, uh, is, is acting responsibly to give Italy a government. The Democratic left does not want to work with Berlusconi at all, but has to. Uh, so let us a good man to make that link. Now, what odds do you give him to be able to form a coalition government that will, first of all, last mm. long enough to actually get anything done, sure. and B, be able to successfully implement this reform agenda that Italy so desperately needs to return to growth? Well, the first odds we have to call are whether he makes it at all, whether he can form a government. Um, I don't know whether he will, but I reckon it's 80% chance that he will. Okay. Um, Will it last? Uh, I think I there's only about a 40% to 50% chance that it'll still be there after the autumn. Mm. Um, and I would have thought there's only a 20% chance of it being there next spring. 
uh, you know, the odds go down uh, as time goes on because uh, clearly the, um, the centre-right would like an election. They'd like to win. Um, and all the evidence is that the debacle that the Democrats have created has put Berlusconi back in the driving seat. He didn't win the election, and given the way the electoral rules operate, he's definitely in a minority in the chamber, but nevertheless, the moment that an election were held, um, looks like he'd win. Right. Um, so there's a good chance he'll bring them down. Now, to what extent will Berlusconi be able to put tax and judicial items onto the legislative agenda? Bearing in mind, of course, that Berlusconi continues to face his own legal woes. We don't know. Um, I don't think we can give an answer to either of those questions, and they are the two key ones. Berlusconi went into the election with ten promises, one of which was uh, that EMU, the tax, the housing tax, uh, should be abolished, and moreover that what was paid, what was, as he put it, forced out of Italian homeowners last year by Mr Monti, should be repaid. That doesn't look terribly practical. Um, and in any case, it would uh, really uh, drive the coach and horses through uh, the budget programme. On the other hand, um, the situation now is completely different from last year in the wider European context. Clearly, everybody's looking for a way, decently and respectably, uh, to ease up on fiscal austerity. And so there's, there's a window of opportunity there for a compromise. And the compromise may well, I think it's unlikely to be, yes, we'll give it all back because I don't think they can. But the compromise might be, OK, uh, we will ease up in ways that Berlusconi can claim is his victory. On the judicial front, it's rather different. Um, that's a very, very delicate one. Who becomes Minister of Justice is, is a key one as far as Berlusconi is concerned because he wants somebody to come down very hard on what he regards as judicial persecution. But President Napolitano is still there. President Napolitano has warned judges that they are to be politically neutral. But I don't think he's in the game of intervening and bringing pressure on, pen, on, on existing cases. So I think that um, that's going to be a continuing theme. And I would say that that's one of the, um, so to speak, excuses that Berlusconi may well wheel out when he wants to pull the plug. Mm. And I think he'll want to pull the plug by the autumn. Um, I think that it suits him <coughs> to appear to be the saviour in a situation where no other party is acting responsibly. And he's got away with it so far. I mean, he's played a blinder. Uh, and I think that he'll continue to do so as long as he sees that to be to his advantage. But at a certain point, he'll want to dissociate himself from um, all the other policies. After all, just being in government, whatever you do, and even if the situation is getting a bit better, is bound to damage you. And that's why he doesn't really want to be there. He just wants to be seen to be responsible enough to give other people mm. the chance to do something. And then at a certain point, he comes in and says, that's it. Uh, we can't agree anymore. An election is held. And he may well do extremely well. People are kind of forgetting where he's come from over the last two or three years, very quickly. It's amazing um, how quickly. Uh, extraordinarily quickly. He's a very, very skilled politician with a terrific you know, media capacity behind him. Now, Italy's had a technocratic government under uh, former Prime Minister Mario Monti. He resigned in November. We had the run-up to the elections. The elections proved inconclusive. And now you're telling us that there's a very strong chance that even mm. if Letta can form a government, it very well could not outlast the autumn. Mm. What is amazing to me about this is the soft ride that Italy has been given in bond markets. Mm. Mm. How do we explain this? Uh, not very easily is, is the answer. Um, I mean, bond rates have come down everywhere. So uh, if they're going to, even if, even, even if the spread were to remain the same, um, uh, Italian bond rates would come down, and they have. They've come down further, um, and indeed bond rates have come down across the, um, the, the, the vulnerable economies. So we've got something to explain, and I guess it's that, I mean, my own guess would be uh, that nobody thinks that the crash is going to come now. Uh, we've got through Greece, we've got through uh, Cyprus. Um, uh, the Italian markets are not so badly placed. The Italians have been very skilled at getting their, their, um, uh, their uh, auctions away uh, and managed it, front-loaded it for 2013 um, pretty well. So nobody, I think, thinks in the relatively short term, and short-term bond markets have, have, have come down a very long way, mm. nobody thinks there's anything serious is going to happen in the short term. And so they're relatively complacent. But of course it could turn on a sixpence, and probably will. And yet the economic fundamentals of Italy are worsening. They're terrible, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Yes, that's, that's right. But um, markets are their own, uh, 
uh, markets have their own logic, um, and market operators in 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 uh, uh, in bonds and foreign exchanges don't necessarily um, uh, operate on fundamentals. In in the short term, they can operate for all sorts of other reasons. Mm. But uh, it would be foolish of me to say uh, that I can tell you why uh, we're going through this. Uh, this phase. Um, uh, all I can say is that I think it's the long waiting period before the German election. Well, we've got an unsolved mystery and we've got a bumpy ride ahead. It looks like we'll have to fasten our seatbelts. Thank you very much, David Hine, for joining us today. And thank you for watching. We'll see you again next week.